the young people that I interviewed were mainly kind of already involved with support services, had already sort of had the support, had their parental substance misuse was already known, and also interviewing their practitioners as well as other practitioners as well. The analysis for this was um, open thematic coding of five of the young person interviews, which was supported by the young person advisory group. I then applied that framework to the rest of the interviews. So just some of the findings. I interviewed 21 young people aged between 14 and 24. Majority of those young people were female and white British. With regards to their experiences, we had 12 young people who experienced parental alcohol use, and that was mainly mum's use. We had seven young people who experienced parental alcohol and drug use, and that was, uh, again, majority mum's use. And then finally, we also had two young people who experienced parental drug use. When trying to um, identify young people, um, I really wanted to try to get more males involved, to get more young people um, from minority ethnicities, as well as sort of focusing on father substance use and parental drug use. And I kind of did a lot of work trying to um, reach those with regards to the services, but unfortunately those services either didn't um, engage with young people with fitting that criteria, or those young people weren't ready to be involved in research. So I also interviewed 44 practitioners from 32 services across England. Those practitioners were mainly sort of frontline staff working day to day with the young people. We also had um, team leaders, managers, safeguard lead and a commissioner. These practitioners were mainly from young person drug and alcohol services, um, which had specialist support for parental substance misuse, affected others or hidden harm. But we also had um, other services involved in this too. So thinking about some of the themes that came out from this research, we had four kind of main themes that I'm going to speak about today. Uh, this are, these are preliminary and there are kind of other themes that I've not got time to talk about as well. So the first one is around a secret identity and young people's, uh, this is very much linked with young people's experiences of stigma, um, of shame and um, prejudice. And a lot of young people felt like either they had to hide their parent substance use for um, a portion of their kind of uh, childhood um, and adolescence, or that they, if that was known, they would maybe be bullied for that or feeling isolated. And as Josh has said here, I'm pretty all right to tell people about my experiences now because I'm not embarrassed anymore. At first I was. I was embarrassed of my parents, but I realised their actions and what they've done don't define me and don't make me as a person. We also had these um, sort of that secret identity and stigmatization, isolation throughout the practitioners' interviews as well when they were identifying the experiences of young people. This practitioner from a social care service said, I think children get stigmatized and isolated at school because they're a child whose mum was sick in the playground or whose school uniform is ill fitting and never fits. That a child who punches other people or is strange, I think there's definitely repercussions of the parents' substance use upon how the child is perceived, normally by other children at school, I think. So thinking about the next theme is with regards to resilience and how this can link to young people's idea of surviving or thriving. And I know we've had quite a lot of discussions about this in the Young Person Advisory Group, this kind of idea around resilience. And when we think about a resilient young person, we normally think of a young person who's doing well at school or who doesn't use their own substances, isn't being excluded, isn't getting kind of involved in um, criminal activity, but actually thinking about that some, as this practitioner has said, some of those resilient behaviours don't necessarily mean they're resilient. It means they've learned to put a mask on it and to show resilient behaviours. But actually what practitioners need to do and what adults around those young people is to realise what's happening inside and this can be reflected in Daisy's um, quote as well, around this idea that she was experiencing quite a lot of physical abuse, but she was doing well at school. 
and it that went unnoticed and she just kind of said it like when she was younger I was living alongside my mum's alcohol use and I knew that I just had to stick it out she got worse and I got more resistant to it this idea that young people are more likely just to try to survive alongside it than choosing to be resilient and we need to make sure that we're helping them to thrive to get what they want out of life So the next theme is really around um, their experiences during lockdown and this feeling that young people felt trapped. A lot of young people said that um, a lot of their support systems weren't around anymore, going to school, um, seeing friends, seeing extended family. They may have been in an environment at home where there was more substance use, more conflict at home. For one young person, they also um, reflect on the fact that actually this was a really good time. Their mum had got support and they'd kind of had the pressure of not having to go into school. But for most young people, it was this idea of feeling trapped. As Emma here says, we were all in the house and obviously mum was drinking. It was just the same environment, just a lot more closed off to the outside world and with not as much help available because of the restrictions. I felt a little bit more trapped, really. And this idea was also reflected in the practitioners' interviews as well, with kind of their reflections on what it had been like during lockdown for young people, but also the services. This was what families and carers are saying is, particularly during lockdown, it's been a real struggle. There's increased tension in the house, poverty, the increase in domestic violence has been massively significant. And supporting young people during lockdown has also been very difficult because you can't have a telephone conversation with someone when the other person is sitting in the next door room. That kind of support has been difficult. A lot of practitioners reflected on this idea that the support had either been put on hold, that had to be really flexible around their approaches to supporting young people, and as well as young people feeling like they had more opportunities to either work online or have text messages instead of phone calls. The next one is around professionals and a lot of young people, um, or all of the young people, had said about how the services that they're involved in now were being are really supportive and they had lots of kind of useful um, and beneficial interactions with their sort of support workers or the people um, supporting them. But some young people did talk about when professionals or adults in their life weren't necessarily always supportive. And this was maybe involved with um, young people kind of lack, lacking trust in some services. Um, as Alfie has said here, I wasn't that happy because the support worker told me that they weren't going to tell my mum about what I told them without my notice first. But I got home and they had already told her, so I was quite annoyed and not prepared. I came in and got a complete ear battering. This young person had kind of been put into a situation where they had increased uh, conflict at home that was quite traumatising for that young person. And then they really kind of withdrew from that service. For other young people, it might have been that what was offered to them wasn't something that they actually wanted. So for Sophie, uh, she much preferred one-to-one -one support, but she was only getting offered family support. And she said, I don't enjoy family support personally, because it's just a bit awkward. Just with my man, it's just a bit much. I think because how much we can, how much can we say without it having an effect on later at home? And a lot of young people had said where they'd had support with their parents when they got home, that increased conflict and tension. They may end up having arguments at home. This was also reflected in practitioners interviews as well, where they noted the young people had told them where support maybe just wasn't helpful. Something that young people have told me over and over again is certainly when they were in primary school, of schools knowing what was going on but not doing anything. It's just they didn't know what to do. It usually happens when they go to secondary school. Something happens or there's a crisis. It always has to be a crisis. And a lot of young people and practitioners discussed that. They wish that somebody had talked about it earlier on. Something had happened at primary school. That support was available to them then. So I now want to pass on to Aidan, if he just wants to start his video and unmute who's going to talk about some of his experiences. 
Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm Aiden, as um, Casey said, and I'm going to just sort of briefly talk about some of my experiences and sort of link it to um, sort of some of the things that Casey's been saying. So I am currently 20 um, and I've grown up with my mum taking um, various drugs and um, also alcohol, like vodka and stuff like that. Um, so when I was about seven, um, my mum started drinking and she gradually got worse and worse, drinking more and more. And then she started moving on to cannabis and then sort of moved on to like heavier drugs. Um, when I was 13 or 12, um, I actually got removed from the house and put into foster care um, where I stayed until my mum passed away from a drug overdose when I was um, 16. Um, so it's I've lived with my mum abusing drugs for um, some years when I was younger, especially during my transition through like primary to secondary school. Um, while that was going on, I also cared for my sister, um, who was sort of born and then started getting older at the time. Um, so I always used like school as a safe place. Um, and because home to me wasn't like a safe space at all. Um, so I'd go into school and primary school um, was all right. It's just that the teachers didn't acknowledge um, that my mum was taking drugs to me and every time I sort of um, sort of like said something about it she would um, like the school would go to my mum and my mum would be like oh no that's not happening and then I'd get like someone else said in the study um, like I'd get an earwig and like um, an absolute mouthful of it and it'd just create conflicts so my primary school then became not my safe space and I literally remember thinking as a person in year six probably like 10 or 11 being like where where am I meant to be safe then I was like where where am I meant to like enjoy enjoy myself um and I really really struggled with that but when I went to secondary school um I got involved with my local young carer service and um, my school also acknowledged to me the fact that my mum took drugs and was drinking and let me talk about it to them. Um, and they did support me with that. And they sort of let me like tell, tell them stuff um, and didn't immediately go to my mum about it, would sort of discuss it first and tell me they were going to go to my mum so that I could like prepare and like actually know what I was going to do with that. Um, Try to think what else. I needed to say I've lost my notes I did make notes for this and now I've lost them um the only other thing is that I thought that my mum's drinking was normal at the time um I remember an incident where I told one of my classmates um that my mum my mum had drank the evening before and they went oh yeah my mum drinks wine too but it was two very, very different levels of drinking and the effects of it as well and nobody um nobody really picked up on that so I genuinely thought that it was normal and thought that I was just being a nuisance by complaining about the, the amount that my mum drank um because I thought oh well everyone does that and my mum was saying oh well everyone does that so there was no like nobody to tell me otherwise that it wasn't all right until um I got involved with young carers and then my secondary school also told me um and then I was like oh and then like Casey spoke about stigma and stuff I definitely felt some of that because at school one I was bullied just for like coming in in the tatty clothes um not being not showering for like a week so I just smelled as like a teenager growing up um and then gradually my mum as she got worse and worse um she would sort of start approaching people from my school and then it got even worse because people would come up to me and be like, oh, your mum's a druggie. And like, um, and eventually as I grew up um, and got older, like probably like year 11, people started actually understanding that my mum was like probably on drugs and like it wasn't really worth bullying me over. But until that point, it really was like um, 
there was a lot of like bullying and I was just a bit weird as well if I, like if I say so myself um so that didn't help either to sort of ice I was very isolated at school um and only had probably one or two friends um but yeah all in all actually I've done quite well um I feel like I have built resilience um and I'm doing this now um and I am at uni and um like I have come out right on the right side, but I feel like that is through a lot of support from like professionals, um, through counselling, through like a bunch of different factors as well, and a lot of support around myself. So yeah, thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Ed, and that was really great. And I'm sure a lot of the audience would have really um, can applaud you for speaking about so honestly about your experiences. So thank you. So I'll just continue with kind of another theme that came out. So we'd asked um, young people and practitioners about kind of what is maybe missing or what how we can support young people going forward. And this theme is really about kind of filling those gaps and thinking about young people's needs and practitioners' needs. So with regards to young people's needs, one of the main things that kept coming up time and time again was this idea that why should young people talk about parental substance use if nobody else is talking about it? And that's kind of within schools, within the family, um, within support, and within kind of the media and a more like population level. And as Josh said here, I never really saw anyone come into school and talk to a vast majority of people so I never saw anyone come out and talk about drug and alcohol misuse, but like within the home. And generally, if uh, drug and alcohol misuse is talking about, it's generally within terms of maybe it's their own use and never really kind of linked with the sort of family or maybe it's other people who um, might affect the, the young person. Anna has also said it was the most amazing thing the first time that I realised that I wasn't the only one that was like this. No one in the media says it. It's not talked about. It can feel really isolating when you don't know that there's anyone else out there. But having other people know that experience and know it's scary helps so unbelievably much. So this is really about kind of making sure that we're kind of trying to reduce the stigma, allowing young people to feel safe to talk about their parent substance use by talking about it ourselves. Next is around practitioners' needs. And this, my PhD was really looking at how we can support young people and how we can develop something for young people. But actually what came out in the practitioner interviews was that we need to support practitioners too, either with staff training, staff support, or trying to develop some sort of toolkit for practitioners. As this practitioner said, I think we all have loads to offer and loads to learn from each other. Support services like reinvent the wheel every time rather than have an essential thing that people can follow. So this was really about having something out there with resources, with kind of the findings from this study and other studies, and being able to kind of connect with one another, but making sure that the young person's voice is at the centre of all this. And this practitioner said, we, we have got some resources out there, but they're really useful, but they're hard to find. I think training is hard to access and it costs money, which nobody's got. So really thinking about how we can develop something for practitioners and make sure that practitioners aren't just kind of working in silos across the country. Unfortunately, I've got um, some extra funding that I've applied for to work with ADFAM next year to try to develop some of these practitioner resources. And hopefully later on this morning, you can help us to kind of think about what that could be. So I'm now going to pass over to Kira, who's going to sort of think about young person's needs and think about what we should develop to support young people. If you just want to put your camera on and unmute Kira. Hello. Um, yes, I'm Kira, and um, a bit of my background is my mum was an alcoholic my whole life. Um, I always had this very strong background memory of her having bottles and drinking, and it was never anything strange to me I was very used to it my whole life and I never understood what it was um so un unfortunately she passed away when I was 11 which was when in my first year of secondary school and when I've reflected I think 
I'm doing really well now. I've graduated university. I've got my own house. I've got my career going. And sadly, I think that is because she's not here anymore. So the reason that I get involved in research and I want to talk about this now is to find ways that we can help fellow young people with long term impact to help them deal with it and understand and to get the life they want ideally with their parents still around and to have a good relationship with them because I feel that my life's got a lot better because she's not here um so a top top kind of five ideas that we um came up with from the few meetings we've had I think the main thing that's kind of already been mentioned is schools um personally for me a lot of the signs that I was neglected at home when my mum was an alcoholic was at primary school. My clothes didn't fit, I wasn't clean, I had nits, I was very malnourished, I didn't eat all the time at home. So at school I ate seconds. It was very obvious, I think, to teachers around me that something was going on. But again, they didn't know how to help, there wasn't anything in place, they didn't know what to do. Um, so one thing that we mentioned is having whole school lessons um, this is particularly in focus of secondary school and it's to get the education out there to all young children, well, sorry, kids at secondary school and to not have a stigma or like a, a narrowing down of, say, the, the 10 kids in that school whose parents are alcoholics and putting them to sign and talk to them. It's getting that conversation going to everybody and to get it talked about and reduce the stigma and normalise it in a way that it's obviously not normal, but whether we're speaking about it, it's gonna happen. Whether a teacher came to me and asked me about my mum, she's still drinking at home. So um, this is a way to raise awareness at an earlier age as well. We thought a lot about primary school, um, which can be something to think about, because obviously you don't want to start sitting down with your very young kids and being very direct, but we thought maybe um, a children's book to start introducing these themes earlier, to get the talk around what's going on at home, to open up that conversation, to make sure that kids know that they don't need to shut down and not talk about something just because maybe their parents don't want to talk about it. It's to get that conversation going. Um, we also, this works really well, which is really important that we all thought was the training of the professionals that encounter young people in general, teachers, staff, anything like that. Um, we need to teach, educate on the signs and the stigmas and the impact of parental use. This will help reduce the stigma and the separation around it. It will help get families the help they need earlier, which will overall reduce the trauma on the children and help break that cycle, the cycle that your parents are drinkers. And then if you see that behavior around you, you kind of get that in yourself that maybe that's a way of dealing with it. But if we talk about it earlier with kids and we get people who are around children to see these signs, it's going to help stop that cycle and get that support earlier. Um, it is happening whether, as I've said, whether we want to talk about it or not. So we need to get the conversation going. And then another thing that would help um, people would be maybe a digital app that could con um, combine a variety of ways of talking to other people our age who are going through similar things, get professional support, um, methods of support, a way to get access to people um, in a variety of ways, but a really wide audience. A lot of people do have phones nowadays. The negative is those who don't have phones can't necessarily access this as much. But when you think about the wide scope, the phone and a digital app and a way to get that support 24 seven feels really useful. And this goes to the same as the idea of maybe tech support rather than a phone line. If you're in the house with somebody who is, um, abusing substances and you're on the phone, it's very obvious that you're talking on the phone. Whereas if it's a text, you can be private, quiet away, talk about what you need to and get the support. And also um, Aidan mentioned this really good point in our meetings that kind of the crisis points don't stop at office hours. Like you, your family aren't fine after 5 p.m. just because there's nobody there to pick up the phone. So it, that accessibility is really important. Um, and then something that we'd all found useful that works really well alongside support is getting groups of young people together who've had the same experiences. And that just helps you feel really calm in my experience. It's, you don't have that worry of what's happening at home or what do these people think about what I want to tell them. It's really calm and you're around, you're around people 
who are going through the same thing that you thought that never existed if that makes sense so you never you, it's very very isolating at home when you've got a parent who is abusing drink or drugs and it's very very a narrow world that if you can't open up to school or to friends or be around other people that have gone through similar experiences it can be very hard to live with and very you can build that stigma on yourself and full of shame and embarrassment and I think there is no number one answer there just needs to be different avenues of accessibility and reach and conversation because I can say my mum was an alcoholic and be absolutely fine whereas 10 years ago maybe more it would have crushed me but it's, it's there's nothing embarrassing about that it's happening to so many people and she's used it as a way to cope with life and that's had a really negative impact on me but that's not my fault and I'm fine now because I've been able to access help um I hope it didn't talk too long and that was okay um yeah thank you for listening to me thanks so much Kira. that was really um great and thank you for kind of summarizing all those points and later on this morning we'll also have a chance to hear from uh, those in the audience around what you think are the priorities for supporting young people. So just really to end our kind of four main take home points is one, an observational one from doing this study, is that kind of current services need to think about how they can engage young people from ethnic minority communities, those impacted by father's use and working with fathers and those who are male. As well as this, we know that young people have a kind of secret identity. They feel the need to hide for feelings of shame, experience prejudice, stigma. And we really need to kind of try to come together and think about what more needs to be done to help young people seek support and to be able to talk about this, to reduce that stigma and increase their resilience and their ability to thrive. And also that a shared learning toolkit or resource needs to be developed for practitioners as well. And you can hopefully help us do that um, later on. So thank you for listening and a really great um, thank you to Aidan and Kira. And I'm going to kind of give you a round of applause just because um, everyone else is on mute. So thank you so much. Thanks, Cassie. Um, and yeah, I echo what you've said. Um, absolutely brilliant presentation. And thank you, Aidan and Kira, for sharing your experiences with us all this morning. Um, really powerful to hear. Uh, so our next speaker is going to be Dan Broxop. Dan is the Young Persons Drug and Alcohol Interventions Worker for Props, which is a local charity based in the northeast of England. Props is a specialist service for people whose lives are affected by somebody else's alcohol or drug use. And Dan has been working with young people for over 10 years and has seen the impact that drugs and alcohol can have on the whole family. Dan's presentation is about the impact of parental substance misuse on the young person and current work that's being done to support young people to a better future. I'll hand over to you, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Claire. And good morning, everyone. As Claire said, my name's Dan and I am the Young Persons Drug and Alcohol Intervention Worker at Props Northeast, based in Newcastle and North Tyneside in the northeast of England. Before I start, I just want to say, you know, a massive thanks to Kira and to Aidan for their shares this morning. I think we can learn a lot um, as professionals from young people like that um, and to gather ideas of how we can better support young people going forward. So thanks a lot, guys. That was really, really informative and I appreciate you coming along this morning. So like it says on the screen, I work for Props, which is a family recovery service. And we support young people and adults within the northeast of England. Some of you may have heard of Props before. Some of you may not, and that's absolutely fine. Um, this morning, I'm just going to give you a little insight into what we do, who we support, and potentially, you know, that might benefit yourselves as professionals or just as an individual. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So, yeah, Props is a charity that was founded in 1997 by a group of mothers in the West End of Newcastle whose sons were misusing drugs at that time. And they used to meet up roughly about once a week, if not more, if not less, depending on obviously their current kind of situation. And obviously discuss current issues that were affecting them as individuals, but also affecting them in their local community and how they can ha have an impact on not only their family, but also the families of others in their community who are impacted by someone else's drug and alcohol misuse. 
And from this little meeting within each other's kitchens, Props was formed um, in 1997 as a charity. And I guess I always just like to remember where we came from um, and our founder, Val, who sadly is no longer with us. Um, but I always just like to remember that great things start from small conversations is, is the quote I like to use. Um, and it's just a reminder a day as professionals that that's one small conversation can have a massive impact on someone's life, whether that's a young person, whether that's a family member, or whether that's a substance user themselves. But I'll just hold on two seconds in case the interruptions are... Uh, Oh, we're good, we're good, we'll carry on. That's great. So yeah, next slide, please. So our support and who we are. So we support young people and adults within the Castle and North Tyneside um, from 11 years plus who have been impacted by someone else's drug or alcohol misuse. Now this may be parental, it may be a sibling, it may be a friend, or may, may even just be extended family members. Um, and we class someone who's impacted as someone who is directly impacted whether that's living with the person who's misusing drugs or alcohol, doing some cooking, cleaning, washing up, whatever that may be, or indirectly impacted, where a lot of the young people that I work with are unfortunately in the care system um, and, and are offering that emotional support um, to their parent or loved one, you know, whether that's through Facebook, Instagram, or just on the phone once a week and that kind of emotional support. So our young persons program, as you can see on the screen in just a little snippet there, um, has been redesigned recently in consultation with the young people that I work with. Um, and it's an eight to 12 week intervention, although we understand that, you know, drug and alcohol misuse doesn't just disappear within them eight to 12 weeks. Um, so the, the intervention can be extended for as long as, need, as needs be really, as long as the needs of the young person are still being met. Um, and we cover topics such as the impact on the young person's life and the impact that it's currently having on their daily life, their school life, their social life. And how it, another topic that we cover is how it makes them feel and, and, and let them obviously release their emotions that potentially have been built up over a period of time, obviously by the situation that they're currently living in. We cover staying safe. If a young person is living within the home and there's potential risk of overdose, or there's a potential that, you know, um, conflict or confrontation might occur. It's how that young person can stay safe and manage that situation and also look at enriching the life of the young person. So a lot of these young people have been brought into a life, you know, through no fault of their own with parental substance misuse. And that is potentially all that they have known. Um, and it's how we can obviously enrich the lives of that young person, a bit like Kira and Aidan, as we've seen before, to go on to progress, you know, to university, jobs, whatever they may wish to do. Something that they might not have experienced, you know, previously um, with other family members. Um, and the support can be extended, like I said, depending on the needs of the young person. In other areas along, along the way can be explored, such as relationships, sexual health, friendships and so on. Our service is completely voluntary and the young person does not have to engage. And we do get a lot of referrals from social services where the young person, you know, kind of feels the need to engage because of obviously the child protection or the child in need plan. That is not the case. The young person can engage or disengage at any time. Um, and our service is also confidential and um, meaning that the young person can access support without the knowledge of the person that they are impacted by. Um, we have a lot of young people like on previous slides just seen that are worried about potential, you know, mom or dad finding out that they've been having a chat about them. And that's not the case, you know, if the young person is at risk and there's a safeguarding, we will follow procedures and we'll let the young person know. But apart from that, the support is between me and them, you know, and we can discuss whatever they wish to disclose during each session. The booklet, again, can be written on, scribbled on, doodled on by the young person, and it's obviously kind of interactive each session. So we cover drug and alcohol awareness, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the sessions are obviously, you know, catered to the needs of each individual. So if the young person decides, actually, you know, my mom's using alcohol and she's drinking wine. Can I learn a little bit more about wine and the impact of that? And yes, that's absolutely fine. But if another young person says, you know, my dad's using cocaine, can I learn a little bit more about that? Again, that's absolutely fine. We'll cater the needs to the young person. And we also have a helpline, um, which is available from nine o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night, seven days a week. And I know that's something that Kira mentioned just before. Um, and we recognized as a service that, you know, after five o'clock, these issues are still occurring. So the helpline is available for anyone. It's available for young people, your adults, or even someone who's potentially going through, you know, a hard time. They can ring us seven days a week, um, nine o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night. Um, and 
just this weekend gone. Um, I was on the helpline and a young person rang me on Sunday um, just basically to simply inform me that he had got his first job um, and he was over the moon. Um, this young person doesn't have, you know, doesn't have contact with parents and does live in the care system. And you know what? That kind of just that little bit of information that he could tell me on that on that Sunday um, makes a massive difference to his self esteem and his well being. So, if we can just take, you know, even if it was six seven o'clock at night, and we can have a conversation with someone, a little conversation again can go a long way. Yeah, next slide, please. So again, we've also developed another booklet um, as seen on your screen now, which is a booklet called Drugs, Alcohol and Recovery. Now it's a booklet which helps professionals, parents or young people to understand drugs, alcohol and recovery in a simplified way. Um, the booklet also explores what support is also available for people who are misusing substances or impacted by substance misuse and gives scenarios for young people to kind of related to their current, obviously, uh, you know, lifestyle or, or what's going on within their life. And these booklets are available for anyone. So anyone that's on today that wishes to have one or just have a look at one, we do have them electronically or hard copies and we can get them sent out. So please just drop your name in the chat or drop me an email at the end and I will make sure that we get some. And the idea is to kind of roll these out to schools, colleges, local youth provisions, so that they can run sessions with young people um, around drugs, alcohol and recovery um, and get young people to understand really what what impact it, it has on that on themselves and also their local community um so yeah again please get in touch if you do wish to have one um next slide please so yeah like cassie said um props took part in the spring study with cassie which we're really grateful for and for adfam for putting this event on today um some of our young people and myself were interviewed as part of the study um, and we're you know we are excited and, and grateful to be part of it and um, which is absolutely fantastic um, and we just obviously look forward to working you know likewise i can see there's about 140 of one here today which is great so we can all work together collectively to kind of impact the lives of young people and um, that'll be absolutely fantastic next slide please so just a quick one i don't want to focus too much on statistics mainly because it's not my area of expertise um, so I'll leave that to the professionals. Well, I just want to highlight a few certain areas um, from statistics around Public Health England, specifically for Newcastle. Um, so, yeah, there was 1,024 new presentations to treatment services within Newcastle between the 1st of April 2019 and the 31st of March 2021. Now, that is new presentations. That is people present themselves to treatment for the first time. Um, so there is a lot more, you know, people in treatment currently. Um, so 21% of these or 216 of these were parents or adults living with a child or young person. And 21% of these or 258 were parents not living with children, but had children. Um, so if my maths is correct, that is a potential of 474 young people if we're classing um, each family as having one child that are impacted by someone else's drug or alcohol misuse. Um, now, obviously, you know what? Like I said before, these are just new presentations um, and we obviously have, you know, families who are already in recovery or potential, you know, so starting their recovery journey um, who are impacted. So, again, we need to obviously make sure that as professionals, you know, and, and as other young people, we are out there ready to support these young people who are coming, you know, coming through um, and needing some support. So next slide, please. So just a couple of the current issues um, from young people that I am currently working with. Um, as professionals, obviously, I think we need to keep at the forefront of our mind while we support young people, the needs of the young people, the families and communities impacted by substance misuse. So as you can see, I will just quick read them out, but um, a young person I'm currently working with, um, her current issue is that mom is currently drinking alcohol and has been misusing alcohol for quite a while. Um, and mom goes to the same shop every day for alcohol. So she's 14. Mom is not currently in treatment and is still drinking. Um, so her question was, um, as professionals, what can we do to engage the wider community and local businesses within our area to recognise the harm and encourage support? I guess we're not taking questions and answers at the moment, but please, any ideas or anything like that, drop them in the chat. Um, and I think we'll obviously get through with them. But yeah, this young person obviously, again, has lived in a life of frustration that she can see her mom go to the same shop every day, seven days a week, buy the same bottle of alcohol. And not one person in that shop has said, you know what, you have been in the shop six days. And actually, you know, 
is there an issue is there something going on that we can support you with um and as a low, as a community and as professionals you know we need to be challenging these things and the next one from another young person is i have never spoke about my mom's drug problem and um, because it's embarrassing like we heard from the two young people before um yeah so mom again currently not in treatment um, and her question is how can we support each other as professionals to encourage more young people to come forward for support um, and this is a conversation that I have all the time. Um, it's around, you know, we may not be experts in this area. You know, we may not be experts. We may not know around drugs and alcohol. But what we can do is we can educate ourselves if we are working with young people in case this comes up. Um, and it's just around having these open conversations, you know, and, and having these small conversations with young people that can mean a lot to each individual. Um, so yeah, it's just something to think about um, while working, you know, especially at props, it's something that we think about every day, how we can improve our support going forward to kind of support the lives of young people and families. Next slide, please. So I just want to quickly point on this, um, every contact counts. So as there are a lot of us here this morning, like I said, 140 of us here this morning, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, from a wide variety of backgrounds, um, up and down the country and organisations, I just want to kind of end the presentation by reminding us all that every contact really does count. So, you know, from shop assistants to GPs, dentists, schools, waiters, waitresses, whoever we may, we may be this morning, um, a small conversation with someone, a young person, a family member, or even someone who's potentially going through a hard time can have a massive impact. And if we don't know, you know, then we can obviously direct them in the right, you know, the right kind of support. Um, and because I do love a quote, and I've obviously used a quote before, I think I'll end on this. So, you know, each one of us can make a difference. Each one of us this morning can make a difference. And together we can make a change. And I think that's obviously why we're all here this morning, 140 of us this morning. And I think each one of us can have that little impact. But together, you know, as a collective, we can make a real difference. Um, and hopefully going forward, we can we can see that, um, you know, in, the, in, in obviously society as a whole so i think i'm just going to end um next slide please my contact details are on there we do have a facebook and instagram page um that is our landline again like i say it's open nine o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock at night so if you do want to drop me a message please feel free that's absolutely fine i'm always available um and if i'm not someone will obviously uh, you know point you in the right direction uh, i think there is a little animation that one of my young people who unfortunately couldn't be here today um, has put together just around the impact of substance misuse on his life um, and if you could just take two minutes to kind of um, have a look at that that'd be great but apart from that thanks for listening guys uh, and i appreciate it thanks a lot
Dan for that presentation and, and for sharing that video. Um, that was really touching actually, that video. And I can see that you've got absolutely loads of requests in the chat for um, the resource you talked about. Um, so I'm sure everybody will be looking forward to receiving that. Um, and just on a personal note, it's really interesting from the point of view of someone who works um, the Change Grow Live with a few different services to hear about um, you know, other services outside of that remit and how they operate and the, the passion that you kind of have for it came across. So thank you for that. Um, we're now going to move on to an activity that Cassie is going to lead on, um, an interactive session. It will involve using the um, OMBIA response, I hope I've said that correctly, which Cassie will talk about. Um, so within the um, interactive activity, if you can raise your hand um, using the reactions button at the bottom of the screen, if you want to ask a question or type into the chat and that will all be monitored, um, but I'll hand over to Cassie now. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, so I'll try and kind of whiz through this maybe it's a bit quicker than I'd originally planned, so I might have to skip a few things. But yes, this is kind of um, talking about some of the uh, things that brought up this morning. So if everyone could kind of open a web browser or kind of go on the phone and um, go to the link ra.ombia.com forward slash, you should kind of see something that looks similar to what you've seen on the screen with regards to it says uh, enter session ID. And I'm hoping that that's going to work. Maybe I should try that myself as well. And if anyone can let me know if it's not working. So when you get to that screen, if you enter spring, ask him for ID. Yeah, that's fine. So the ID is spring 21. So it should be a capital S for spring and then 21. Yeah, so the poll is closed currently, it should be closed currently maybe because I haven't started anything, but if you join, should work. Let's see. So it's worked on mine. Yeah, so if I go through to polling, it should work. Let me just check. Okay, yeah, so it should say polling is closed, that's fine. So if you get to that page, it's all worked. So I will let people kind of go through that. So you will join and there is opportunities to kind of um, speak or add to the chat. So I will go forward. So the first activity is really around what we should prioritise. And this is based on the interviews with young people and practitioners. They were asked at the interview about what we could develop for um, young people whose parents use substances. And I kind of went through that and then they came up with around 20 ideas for how we could support them. Earlier, you heard from Kira about what young people have thought of their priorities for um, this uh, support. But we would like to hear from you about what you think would be the most beneficial. So if you kind of think about some of these ideas, there was a document that was sent out with all the ideas on, but I'm just going to kind of quickly go through those now. So the first one was a digital app or website for young people, which you've heard about from Kira. The next one was a social media support groups. So this was more kind of an informal support, thinking around an Instagram account or Facebook group. Um, 
also an opportunity for online forums for young people. So this was really facilitated and monitored by professionals that they could access, talk to other young people, but also get support from professionals. Another idea was a podcast for young people to share their experiences and learn from others. To develop stories or books about young people whose parents use alcohol or drugs. And as you heard from Kira, they kind of thought that that would be really useful um, in primary schools. Also interactive games, so video games or card games around parental alcohol or drug use and strategies to cope. Free 24-7 text support lines, so for those young people who maybe don't want to speak on the phone, or for those that maybe do, an anonymous phone line, particularly for parental substance misuse and young people. A national campaign uh, to reduce the stigma around parental alcohol or drug use and young people seeking support. Access to grants um, or money or resources to use on activities or hobbies of interest for young people. Other ones were around one-to-one -one support with a professional. A lot of young people really wanted one to, uh, to make sure that there was one-to-one -one support or groups of young people who have similar experiences. To start some of this work in primary schools, so either lessons from teachers or talks from professionals or kind of incorporating that kind of story or book um, to talk around kind of other people, um, young people affected by other people's substance use and how young people can maybe manage that. Similarly, again, sort of having those whole class lessons in secondary school or possibly targeted lessons as well. As well. To have a youth mentor or peer mentor, uh, this is, was especially within kind of existing services or schools so that young people can go to someone who's of a similar age and has similar experiences. Next would be residential weekends or activities away from the home so that they're with mixing with other young people, kind of doing things, having um, some of those like, childhood activities, but where they're not really focused around parental substance misuse. Having family support, so along with parents, this one was mainly came through from practitioners, but a lot of the young people didn't really like family support. Also just support for the parents themselves to either reduce their alcohol use or to improve parenting skills. So that one wasn't really involving the child but was focused on the parent that would help the young person. We also have training for all professionals around parental alcohol and drug use. And like Dan said, trying to make every contact count. And then also a brief intervention for adults. So adults accessing alcohol or drug treatment services and this is where they maybe are asked whether they um, have young people who they live with or that they see on a regular basis. And if that's the case, to get some sort of brief intervention around the impacts of substance use on children. So it's kind of over to you and I'm hoping that that kind of um, Ombia programme has worked. So first of all, it should hopefully have came up, I think, before. Um, but you have the option now to pick two ideas which you think are most beneficial from this 10 list. So we could only split them up into two groups of um, 10. So obviously the next one will be the next 10. Um, and I can see that those are going up. So we've had 28 responses so far. So it's definitely working. So while you're thinking about this, the next question is, one word answer so basically what one word is the reason for your kind of for your picking those two beneficial ideas i'll keep that going because it's still going up we have 77 responses and oh no it's still going up Also, if anyone wants to write in the chat box as to why, why they've picked the two that they've picked, that'll be really great because we'll save the chat for later and I can kind of go through that and think about the reasons for um, those being picked. Okay, I'm gonna stop that there. So that's gonna generate the results. 
So the two main ones was a digital app or website and the text line. So I've made a note of those and we'll come back to those um, in a bit. So the next question is in one word, so one word only, why did you choose the most beneficial uh, ideas? If you can think of one word and also put them in the chat for your other reasons, if you kind of want to um, say a bit more than one word. I realize this is like very difficult. I, when I was testing this out, um, I tried kind of a group of words, but it would just break them up into um, singular words. So it didn't work if you kind of wrote a sentence, um, but it will produce a word cloud. Okay, we've got the responses are going up. Okay, oh, I'm going up again. Okay, I'm going to stop that there and see what see what happens. Okay, so the bigger the word, obviously, the more people have wrote it. So we've got things like awareness, accessibility. Um, well, there's lots around kind of access, accessible. Um, support, we've got sharing, smartphones, school, brilliant, that's great. So the next one um, is same thing, but we've got this sort of second list of uh, 10. So if you just want to kind of write down what you think would be most beneficial from these two ideas, and then we'll kind of do the same thing if you have one word that you think would um, is the reason why. And again, put into the chat box. I'm going to have a look at the chat box, see what's coming through. So with regards to 24 seven text, many of the young people text me after work. Oh, I've lost it, it's moving. Thinking they can, one anonymous chat may start the person thinking they can have safe help and hopefully take the next step. It's about kind of safety. So awareness for a national campaign and to reduce stigma help to normalize and um, connection and safety of the text issue. So we've got kind of primary and secondary school lessons. Fab. So I will stop that there and see what's come through for this one. Okay, so we've got I guess three top ones. So it's one-to-one -one support within primary school lessons and training for professionals. So I'll just make a note of that. And I will move on so you can write the one word as to why that might be the case. Why is that the most beneficial? Again, if you wanna kind of write more than one word, just add that to the chat. I'll go through the chat box and see what's been said. Um, Sandra said it's also about educating the parents. Yep. One-to-one -one support groups. As a former youth worker, it's moving too quick. As a former youth worker, providing the trips and social activities for young people who would miss out from the family experience. These are vital. Brilliant, so I will um, stop that there, see what has come up. Okay, so for this one, it's around sort of support and awareness again, and kind of I guess, early education, early kind of prevention. It's about thinking about normalizing things, education, focusing on relationships, Brilliant. So, um, so from the top responses, <clears throat> write one word of what you think is actually sort of maybe is what we should focus on. So the, the kind of five that we had was app. So you could write app. It was text. So the text service of text. 
the one-to-one -one support, so just write one. Primary school, so write primary. And then training professionals, so write training. So what you think are the top from that five? And again, if you want to kind of add extra comments in the chat, we can um, go through that. So Richards wrote, it'll be great to have a teaching perspective. They asked to do so much with little flexibility. Yeah, in the curriculum would need national sign up, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely kind of we need to really work with sort of schools and teachers um, and within the education system to see how we can sort of uh, do this and would it be feasible um, as well. OK, so I'll stop that and see what people have wrote. OK, so training was definitely um, one of the main ones, as well as kind of trying to focus on primary school. And I guess that's kind of the early intervention um, as well. I think that says, I think someone might have wrote creating them all, or someone's put all. Um, so yeah, they're all a priority. So we're kind of going to do exactly the same sort of thing, um, but with what you think of the least beneficial ideas, just so we can get a scope of kind of the top ones and the bottom ones. And when um, asked for young people, a lot of the young people responded back being saying that it was really hard to think about what the least priority are, because actually all of them would be really useful for young people. And um, it kind of incorporating them, either developing something new or trying to incorporate that into our own own services would actually be really useful. So this one is what two ideas would be least beneficial for supporting young people from this first list. I can see that's going up. I'll just check the chat box. Children are fearful to speak up. Oh, it's moving too quick. It's gone. I think that was saying children are fearful to speak up. So having training for professionals would be good. Right. I'm going to stop that one there and see what comes from that. So for this one, kind of the least. Uh, beneficial would be pod podcasts and the games. So I'm going to just skip past this one for time, um, but kind of write your reasons for why you think those two are the um, sort of least beneficial or the ones that you picked. So the next one um, is what two ideas would be least beneficial for supporting young people from this list? So if someone's wrote about the apps, apps and phones may continue to exclude young children again as they are less likely to have access to phones. Yep. We've got kind of least, um, children are least likely to access um, those things. So I'm assuming that's kind of around games and podcasts. Okay, I'm gonna stop that on there. So apologies to the people who are still coming through with that. Okay, so the kind of least beneficial would be a brief intervention with adults. And I guess residential weekends would be sort of the second one on there. Um, possibly kind of uh, youth mentors, family support and groups as well. So thinking about the sort of top responses at that time, if you can write either 
the word podcast, games, brief, or residential. So those are the kind of um, on the lower uh, least beneficial for young people. So I'll just repeat that it was either podcast, games, brief for brief intervention or residential. And oh, missed. so the kind of least beneficial were, I guess, podcast there is in big sort of brief and games. So they're the kind of three um, that would be sort of least beneficial from that list. That's brilliant. Thank you. So the next question is really, would you be willing to kind of share these ideas with the young people you work with? and get them to try and identify their sort of favourite and least favourite ideas um, from this. And maybe we can, you know, you can email me about this um, if you're interested in doing that with the young people, uh, or also if it's not applicable to your work or why you're here, then that's fine too. Okay, we've got some yeses coming through on um, chat. So yeah, just take a note of the my email address and just give me an email after this or at some point if you're interested and I will stop that there. Okay, so we've got lots of yeses, not applicable. Brilliant, so yeah. Do get in touch if you kind of a yes or a maybe. So the next activity, I'm not sure how much time. So if I just use five more minutes, someone do kind of butt in if um, we need to take a break. But the next um, activity is around supporting practitioners and what I sort of spoke about earlier with regards to trying to develop that resource for practitioners. And really kind of to try to get your feedback on what this resource could look like. So it could involve um, a report of the findings. So having all these findings in a place where it's easily accessible to practitioners um, and really trying to focus on the young person's voice to have kind of having sort of services and organizations kind of sign up and want to share their kind of contact details and what they offer and um, kind of trying to create connections amongst the services across England. The other one would be having kind of a place for useful resources used with young people that kind of services use um, or kind of top recommendations and kind of tips for supporting young people. We also um, could include kind of why support is beneficial for young people. And this was really around, um, I think a practitioner had said, it's hard to kind of engage commissioners and having something that could tell them what's been useful in the past, why this is good, uh, would be useful to have that in one place. The other thing would be around kind of tips for other professionals can do. So a kind of section in that for um, teachers, support workers, social workers, um, police, um, paramedics, doctors, nurses, um, having a sort of place that can build awareness um, for other professionals in young people's life. Or other, so there might be something that hasn't actually been mentioned yet that you've got kind of other ideas for. And it's kind of important, I guess, to say for this, you can choose more than one. And that's still going up. I'm going to check quickly the chat box. Okay, so Donna shared a useful resource. It's brilliant. Um, we've also got, I can ask colleagues to ask young people to share these other helpful resources. We've got Social Worker Toolbox, NACOA. Fab, so I'm just gonna 
stop that. See what comes up. Ooh. And so I guess the two top ones is really around that kind of sharing of useful resources and kind of having those recommendations and guiding principles for supporting young people and possibly some sort of tips. But really kind of a mixture of things, but definitely having a place where we can um, share useful resources. So if you kind of did write other or you've got other ideas, um, here yeah, it's just a chance to kind of put that into words so that we can kind of think about that when we'd start developing that next year. And definitely check, check the chat box because there are other um, resources coming through as well to share. So definitely kind of click on those links. There's one about competent compassion, some more from Nicola. Okay, that's the numbers are still going up for that one. So I will stop it here. That worked. Okay, so we've got lots of things, but definitely kind of things to do with training. Um, we've got toolkit, so I guess that's kind of um, a bit of everything, kind of putting that all in together with resources, um, things for online or having it online, um, worksheets to work through. So I guess that's kind of in addition to the kind of resources, what kind of things can services use possibly kind of links with mentors or young people's stories um, and ideas for that. Brilliant. So uh, another one kind of like the other one, uh, would you be interested in supporting us develop uh, this kind of practitioner resource next year? Would you be interested to kind of maybe come along to a meeting where we kind of uh, think about some of these ideas and how we can maybe use that for to make sure that it's useful for those who are going to um, it's intended for. Cassie, I'm just mindful we need um, space for a quick break before we yeah. have the second part of the. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's fine. This is the last question. I, I don't want to no, stop you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Thanks, Claire. And okay, so we've got lots of yeses um, and maybes. So yeah, again, please do kind of reach out, get in touch with me, um, email me about what, um, if you'd like to get involved in that. And that's me for the interactive session. I hope that was kind of useful to see what um, everyone was thinking on the group with regards to young people's support. And we can think about what young people have said that they want and what practitioners have said and we kind of now can think about where that goes forward so thank you i'll hand back over to you claire thanks cassie um so we'll just take a quick comfort break now um i hope everyone doesn't mind but have shortened the break slightly just so that we can get the rest of the morning in so we just take five minutes um of time to get a drink um so if we come back at 11 26 that'd be lovely thank you Okay, so I'm hoping that everybody's back now, but I'm mindful of time and that we've got um, another speaker and another um, and a Q and A session at the end. Um, so we'll get started with our next speaker, who is Ruth McGovern. So Ruth is a lecturer in public health research at the Population Health Sciences Institute at Newcastle University. She is the lead for social care research for both. The Northeast and North Cumbria ARC and Clinical Research Network. Additionally, Ruth is the co-lead for the FUSE Early Life and Adolescent Programme and Deputy Lead for Supporting Children and Families Research there within the ARC. Ruth's research has a strong interdisciplinary focus and aims to promote social justice through improving health and social care for vulnerable children and families. 
Much of her work is concerned with the development and evaluation of public health interventions delivered within social care to address parent Ooh, sorry, I'm trying to read the right. Parental risk factors and bring about benefits to both parent and the affected child. Ruth has a professional background in social work and counselling, specialising in drug and alcohol treatment. I'll hand over to you, Ruth. Apologies for the mouthful. <laughs> so, yes, I'm going to talk to you about the effectiveness of psychosocial interventions at reducing the frequency of alcohol and drug use in parents and I'm not going to particularly because of time but I'm not going to um, go over the background too much because I think Kira and Aidan and, and Cassie and Dan did an excellent job of that um, and clearly helped us to understand that that parental substance use impacts upon the child. Um, it does also impact upon the parent um, and I think possibly the best way to prevent the impact upon the child is to address the parental substance use in the first place so that that child doesn't have to experience some of the hot, uh, the, the really um, distressful things that we've heard about today. But unfortunately, despite the fact that we know that this is a real problem um, for the parent and for the child, very little is known about the best way to intervene in order to, to reduce the parental substance use. So I'm gonna to talk to you about some work that I led, which really tried to review everything that is known about this particular subject matter. And that this is a, a presentation which is based on a, a Cochrane review, which is a systematic literature review. And for those of you who do not know, um, are not familiar so much with, with systematic reviewing, basically what we do is we, we, we try and um, look for everything that is available in the literature and set out ahead of time what our interests are, a priori, um, setting out your essentially your inclusion criteria for a review, and then systematically search for, for, for literature that responds to the specific questions in the specific literature um, review inclusion criteria that you've set ahead of time. And the point in that, because it's a lot of work, the point in that is in order to, to move away from the kind of literature review certainly that I used to do before I was introduced to systematic review, which was basically to look for literature which supports my world view <laughs> and, um, and, and use that literature to, to, to frame and build an argument. And as a result, that's really biased. So systematic literature reviewing goes against that and really sets out a, a, um, an approach that hopefully includes everything that's relevant in your particular subject matter and gives a real balance and objective view of what is effective. And the, the inclusion criteria that I set out ahead of time was that we use an established framework for this called the PCOS, where you look at who the population of interest is, what the intervention of interest is, and the things that you would include um, in terms of a comparison group or a, a study design. And my particular review was really interested in um, looking at substance use in adults who were parents, um, so those that were aged 18 or more, um, and who had children who were aged between 0 and 21. And the intervention specifically was your non-pharmacological um, psychosocial interventions. And I was looking at trials, randomized control trials or non-randomized control trials that compared an experimental intervention against a, a, a comparison intervention. And that's because you need a comparison group in order to really understand whether it's the intervention that's brought about um, this, or, or probably the intervention that's brought about this change rather than a natural course, a natural trajectory of the particular phenomena under interest parental substance use. And specifically, I was really interested in the reduction in, in the frequency of, um, of substance use. But I also, in the, in the Cochrane Review, looked at other things, including outcomes for children. Um, I found a lot of literature um, that, that um, spoke to this particular issue, but actually only 28 papers which were reported on 22 unique studies which really responded clearly to this PCOS, this inclusion criteria. I'm not going to talk about all of them today because quite frankly we don't have time but I am going to talk to you about the eight papers that resulted in a meta-analysis and again for those of you that are not familiar with this approach, meta-analysis pools all of the statistical data that relates to um, individual studies and in doing so you get a more powerful result and hopefully when I come to the, the findings of this this will become apparent. 
So to give you an overview of the literature, so all eight of the studies that I included in the meta-analysis were from, from the states. And actually the 28 um, that fed into the, the overall Cochrane review, many of those were, were, were from the US also, the majority of them were. And we find that all the time in research, um, that there's, there's, there's a lot of activity from the US in this particular area. The vast majority of the, um, of the studies that are included in the Cochrane review were, were referring to, to to mothers and we often when we say parents what we often mean is mothers um, and actually um, in the the meta-analysis the eight studies only five of the studies I'm sorry five of the studies looked specifically at mothers only one looked at mothers and fathers but again what they meant was mothers over 75 percent of that particular um, cohort were mothers and we had only two studies that looked exclusively at fathers the interventions could be um, broken down into essentially three different kinds. You've got your traditional drug and alcohol type treatment that's been adapted slightly for parents. So that, that adaptation was typically things like um, to providing childcare um, or providing transport or going out to the families and doing the work within the home in order to try and engage. Um, there was interventions which looked um, entirely at parenting and family. Um, but then there was also the, the interventions which integrate the, these two approaches. And typically these interventions would include um, some um, psychosocial intervention looking specifically at parenting skills, but also how that is impacted by substance use and vice versa. Okay, so here's the findings. For those of you that like a forest, forest plot and are statistically minded, this is for you. For those of you who like me or not, <laughs> stick with me. Um, don't give up on me. I will explain what these means and, and, and use words, which is, is by far my preferred means of, uh, of thinking and, and communicating things. But basically what this particular slide shows is the forest plot. So the pooling, the meta-analysis of the three different intervention types. Up in this corner here, this is the interventions that were pooled specifically around substance use. So these were the more traditional drug and alcohol treatments. You've got this one here, which was purely around parenting focus. So these were interventions that, that exclusively looked at parenting scale. And these ones over here were the ones that integrated. And what you can see very quickly, um, once I tell you how to, to, to read them, um, from these particular forest plots is that these ones here are not effective. If you intervene in this way, there's every chance that that parent will not reduce the frequency of their substance use when compared to control groups. It's only if you integrate parenting skills with substance use interventions that you bring about any change. So here you can see this diamond, this is the result here of the pooled statistics and it doesn't cross that line. That's what you're looking for. Here again, it doesn't cross the line, it stays just it touches it, but it doesn't cross the line. And what this is, is your result at six month follow up and at 12 month follow up. And they're quite established time points that we tend to use in intervention effectiveness studies to see whether there's an effect and if that effect is sustained to a, you know, an established change. The other thing, just for those that are statistically interested, is that this number here suggests that that's quite a decent effect. It's what we call a, a, a moderate effect size. This one is almost moderate, but it's, it, it's still what we would call quite, quite small. And I mentioned meta-analysis increase in power. The thing to look at here is all these individual studies, um, oops, excuse me, all these individual studies touch or cross the line, yeah? That would suggest that those individual studies don't really show significant effect, but when you put them together, they do. So the, the headline from this, and I'll not go into so much detail on each of these slides, but the headline for this is, if you want to intervene to reduce a parent's substance use, you need to attend to both their substance use needs and their family needs and help the parent to consider the two things together. Individually, it will make a difference. Okay, so now thinking about mothers and fathers, again, you can see, hopefully, from, from the description I've just given you, that, um, that there's, there's not a lot actually happening here for mothers. This one over here is about the frequency of alcohol use, and this one over here is about the frequency of drug use. And it's only short-term mother's alcohol use that remains significant. So from this, hopefully what you can see is that it's quite difficult for women, for mothers to make change with these interventions that were used in this particular, um, particular meta-analysis. However, 
if you look at fathers, remembering that there's not that many studies on fathers, so this is a relatively limited um, pool, you've got fathers who are able, who are, who are alcohol misusers, who are able to make change at six months and at 12 months to significant levels. And also, if we look at drug use, longer term change um, is, is significant, 12 month change is significant in fathers. So what we see from here is that it's possibly harder for mothers to make change than what it is for fathers to make change with, a, with psychosocial interventions. This one is a really interesting one. And before listening to the presentations this morning, I thought it kind of went against logic because as a social worker, my background, there was, there's always been a real emphasis in the voice of the child and involving children in everything you do. And philosophically, there's lots of really great reasons for doing that. It's about the child. The child has often been silenced in many of the situations that, that we're concerned about. And it's really important to make sure their views are heard. But listening to people this morning, it's evident that actually there's repercussions to that and it can, it can cause difficulties for children in those situations if they are made to be involved and made to say things, particularly if that's in front of the parent. And what's interesting here is the reverse is true. If we make parents talk about drugs and alcohol or other things relating to that in front of children, they are far less likely to make a change. And I guess we can we can hypothesize that's probably because the parents feel greater stigma themselves or feel more um, find it more difficult to open up and, dis and disclose things honestly and openly in front of their children either because it's not appropriate for the child to hear and that's that's great that the parent is making an effort to protect the child in that way or because it's hard for them to fess up and say that maybe looking after a child is a difficult thing um, and then maybe times so that that makes addressing their substance use even harder for them. So I guess what, what we can take from both this morning and hopefully the, the, the session today after, after break that I'm presenting to you is that whilst maybe both parties need some support, it's possibly not best to do that together. So my conclusions. Um, the things that I would, would hope that you would take away from this presentation is that we need to do more than usual drug treatment to help parents. If we just assume that parents can rock up at a drug and alcohol service and alongside somebody else um, who isn't a parent and get benefit, then we're probably wrong. And that actually we might need to do more for families. We might need to do more for parents who experience substance use because there's, for some reason, it's harder for that group of people to address their substance use. Um, I'm gonna reflect on what that reason might be in a moment. The other thing that I would hope you would take away from this is that fathers may benefit more and mothers, it might be a bit harder. And why, I think the reasons, I think the reasons for why traditional drug treatment and the reasons for why mothers might find it harder, I think, I think they're similar. You may be familiar with the idea of recovery capital and, that, and that's an idea that was um, suggested by um, authors Crowd and Granfield famously and they talked about how some people can naturally recover from substance use and they do that because they have I guess this this inner resource which they refer to as recovery capital and often it's things like family um, it's things like um, a job it's things like um, good mental health they also developed that theory further and later introduced this idea of negative recovery capital. And what we find with parents is that they often have more negative recovery capital because of the stigma, because of the fact that some of these families have either lost care of their children or are certainly criticized. Um, and we understand the reasons why, but they are criticized by society for, for behaving in certain ways. But that doesn't introduce an obstacle for these for these mothers and these fathers to address their substance use and therefore an obstacle for the children to to um to have to continue to to attend to um, in terms of the, the the parents substance use the other thing about the women particularly in the studies that were meta-analyzed in my review was that these women had had much more challenge in their life than what the fathers within the studies that we meta-analyzed had the fathers, remember, and there was only two studies and, and there was four um, cohort groups that we, we, we met or analyzed in that particular, in that particular analysis looking at fathers. 
they were men who had a partner and it was um, an inclusion criteria of those studies that those partners weren't substance users and they got treatment together. They put, most of the men had jobs. Most of those families retained the care of their children. In fact, that was an inclusion criteria for at least one of those studies that they, they had a, a child resident with them. If we look at the literature for mothers, first of all, the majority of the interventions were just focusing on the parenting skills, which I've already hopefully shown to you is not enough. And I think that speaks a little bit to how we approach mothers in society and we sometimes forget about their needs and only intervene with them as a mother and actually what I'm what I'm trying to encourage here is that we need to be intervening with these women as women with their own needs as well as parents with needs as a parent. They often had lost care of the children. They'd often been in prison. They'd often, many of them were homeless or had experienced abuse as a child or had actually been a looked after child themselves. So this is a vulnerable population who probably need a lot more than what these particular interventions were providing. Um, the other thing I want again to, to just reflect on is about the idea that involving children may not be helpful um, and that actually it, it's it's a good idea to respond to the needs of children of course it is but possibly in their own right and separate one of the things i just want to highlight to you is my um my my review um also looked at the the impact upon children as a result of these interventions and we were trying to find out whether if you intervene with the parent and reduce their substance use that does benefit a child and unfortunately the data just wasn't there to allow us to meta-analyze that and, and find anything conclusive and there was there was lots of inconsistent results about whether it did actually benefit children or not so it's hard to, to, to make a firm conclusion, but what I would say is that um, other review work I've done in another area, which looks at um, the, the um, interventions for affected um, family members who aren't children, has found that actually interventions which are all about reducing the, 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 the focus user's substance use are not enough to bring about benefit for those family members. And if I think back in my practice life, um, I would often speak with carers who would say to me, I'm okay, if you just sort out little Johnny, I'll be okay. If you can stop him from using drugs or stop her from using drugs, I'm okay. But actually what research suggests is that the impact upon the affected other is great and actually they need support and treatment in their own right. So my ending conclusion, I guess, about this is whilst we couldn't find out from this review whether intervening only with the parent was enough, um, to help the child, it probably isn't. And actually, whilst I would much rather imagine a world where children don't need support because of parental substance use and are, and we can remove the risk factor altogether in the first place, it's probably not gonna happen. And even if it does, they've already been exposed to the risk factor and actually they probably need some support to work through that anyhow. Um, just wanted to quickly highlight some limitations. As I mentioned, um, the, the, the vast majority of the studies were looking at mothers, not fathers. There's a, there's a gap in our knowledge about fathers. And whilst there is some implication that fathers can do better, this was a particular group of fathers. And actually, fathers who are maybe estranged from the families, who don't have contact with the children, are likely to have needs as fathers, um, even though they don't continue to have maybe parental responsibility or even parental involvement. Um, so I think we need to understand that role more. Um, the limitation about whether this data can be appropriately uh, translated into a UK context, given that it's all from the US and they've got very different childcare and healthcare systems um, there. Um, and also we, we really need to understand more about how to work with the most vulnerable of mothers. Here's a reference for the overall review, if you've got a couple of days of your life free, because they are quite hefty things, um, that they offer, it's freely available and people can, can pick up that review and have a look at it online. And also my email, I'm very happy also always to, to talk to anybody who has an interest in this area, because it's something I'm very passionate about, so I'd be very happy to hear um, from any of you. Thank you, Ruth, for that. That was brilliant. Thank you. Um, we're going to move swiftly on now to the question and answer session, just looking at time. So just wanted to welcome back all our speakers. If you would be happy to pop your cameras on for us. So that's Cassie, Aidan, Kira, Dan and Ruth. 
Um, if anyone wants to um, raise your hand to ask a question or type into the chat, Laura and Rob are going to be monitoring that for us. So, how are we looking? Any questions? Okay, I can't see that there's any hands raised just yet, but bear with me because there's quite a few. Oh, hold on, Richard, Richard Merrifield raised yeah. a hand. Richard, would you like to turn on your camera and unmute to ask your question? <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Ruth, and all of the speakers for your really excellent uh, um, presentations today. Ruth, the question's really for you. Um, I've just come out of an MSc in public health and um, kind of aware from Michael Marmot's stuff that if we improve the quality of life and build the foundations for society, the behaviour change stuff and addiction aspects are likely to kind of follow. And what we what we historically do, both in provision and commissioning, is focus on a health issue, in yeah. this case, drug misuse, and mm -hmm. target interventions and have, like, expect people to reduce their alcohol and drug consumption without focusing on the foundation. So I was just, I put it in the chat, I was just interested in the main outcome that we always look for is the reduction in substance misuse and less about quality of life. And I just wondered what your yeah. views on that were and, and what others might Yeah, be. I mean, I agree with you, absolutely. And one of the things that is, is a key determinant, of course, as well, is poverty. And the fact that actually, you know, if we keep on focusing on, on the, 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 the symptoms, I guess, of some of the problems in society, then we're probably blaming the people who are impacted by a lot of the problems, and that's not helpful. The challenge is always that those upstream interventions are really difficult and really hard to do. And I think in the in the meantime, we need to be addressing um, the things that we can get in whilst we're trying to address the really tricky problems within society. My sense is that we need multi-level interventions and that one of these things isn't enough. Um, and I think definitely the upstream interventions are important, but increasingly what I'm getting interested in in my own research is relational practice and practice that's informed by a lot of the, the understanding about the wider determinants um, upon people's health. Um, because I've done a, a number of these types of projects where I'm looking at a specific health behavior or I'm looking at a specific intervention and trying to work out if, it's fit, if it can fix the problem. And often you find some evidence of effect, but you're trying to do something in isolation. And actually some of the, 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 um, the ingredients of effective interventions go across all of these different um, interventions and address a range of different health behaviors. And I think what we need to do is stop stepping back, back a bit and, and looking more about a, a model, a, a, an approach to practice that spans across all of the, um, the health behaviours, such as, for instance, a, a, a relational based practice or practice that's really poverty informed. Thanks. Thanks for that question, Richard. Um, I can see Michaela's got her hand up. It isn't a question, it was just something that, that I wanted to share. So, you know, I've been working with, you know, I'm a, I'm a hidden harm lead and I've been doing this for 10 years, but um, I'm involved with um, Pan Hidden Harm, which is a forum. Um, mm -hmm. And I just wanted to kind of promote that out to the group now, because at the moment we're getting together because we've realized for a long while that there's still so many professional social workers um and you know other people that that don't that are not aware of hidden harm and so we're trying to at the moment is kind of collate all of our resources and our training programs to sort of create one standardized hidden harm training that we could share for nothing um to just sort of you know build the awareness because you know we've been working like so I've been working in this field for 10 years and it's very solitary. I mean things have improved. There's there's so many more I work for WDP, used to work for CGL. There's so many more hidden harm workers. I mean when I started at CGL I was the I was the first hidden harm worker there. So so it, it is obviously gaining more awareness but um yeah I just wanted to put that out there and I'm more than happy to sort of share my email or um yeah I just wanted to make that comment. Thanks Michaela. 
Michaela. Um, I think if you wanted to put stuff in the chat, people would great, really gratefully receive anything that um, anybody wants to share, um, if you're happy to do that. Um, Laura, yep. Rob, thank you. Is there any other hands or anything in the chat, Laura or Rob, that I might have missed? I don't have any hands, but um, just over to Rob to see if there's any specific questions being posted in the chat of recent there. Yeah, so there's a few actually for um, Aidan and Kira. So um, one's just come through from Sasha saying, um, we are starting a project in which we will be delivering sessions within schools around the transition to high school, and we'll be discussing substance misuse, safety and hidden harm. What information do you feel we could give that would have prompted you to trust the professionals around you so you could have shared your story sooner? Um, I think one of the things is that normally when like all that kind of stuff is discussed, it's around um, like drinking as a teenager or like the harmful effects of it as a teenager or like um, like um, we watched some sort of like show where there was a car crash and like people died and it's like, oh, like and that in itself is very scary. <laughs> um, but I think also sharing that it can happen in the household or that family members can drink as well and that that's the effect and you don't have to like be really really obvious with like drugs are used in households in some places but you can definitely be like you may be thinking of drinking some adults do it some children do it just sort of making it more like normalized without like but still highlighting that it's a problem if that makes sense like um, yeah, that would be my advice, is just that nobody really explicitly says it, especially at primary school, in my opinion. Um, I think following on to that, what I would say is um, to open the platform of conversation, but to not have a time scale on it and, you know, to kind of plant in that idea that can sit and kind of stay with you and, and know that, oh, there are these teachers that I can go to and there's this room I can go sit in at any time in my whole school career if I just want to sit and have a chat about it and know that that's there because I think it takes a lot of courage and to take that first step and for teachers to open that door and for also it's the way it's delivered I feel like I teachers are really under stress a lot of the time and they have so much to do and I could feel quite a burden in general that was from my mum's alcohol use I didn't want to burden this teacher when they seemed really stressed and then they're like, oh, I've got to do this talk about hidden harm and then, oh, I don't really have time to fit you in. It's, it would just be a nice, relaxed environment that doesn't have a, a time scale limit. And just that conversation of, as Aidan said, normalising it and making the conversation to that teacher not feel such a big step, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Thank you both for that. I think that would have been really helpful to um, a lot of people in the room. Um, Laura and Rob, where are we going next? I'm, I'm just aware of the time, so I'll be guided by you on how many questions um, or comments we've got time for. Okay, well, we've got three hands currently raised, um, and, but I know Rob also said that there was more questions in the chat, so maybe we'll take one more hand and one more question from Rob, if that's okay, because we've got four minutes left. So I think the first hand that we raised was uh, Melanie So. Yeah, um, hi, it's been great this morning. I'd just like to say it's just an observation, really. I absolutely agree with what Aidan was saying in terms of the way that professionals and adults respond to parental substance misuse in general. It's a bit like sex and death. It's one of those topics that feels to me that is quite often in the too difficult to manage box. So let me just leave that there because um, we really don't know how to respond to it. I think we need to get over that as professionals. And I feel very strongly around helping professionals understand that it's not a magic portion that we need. It's that basic building of resilience in our children by having those open conversations and being available to have those conversations. Um, I think the presentations have been really helpful. I think what young people have identified that would be helpful for them. Um, is really encouraging and it's great, but I do believe, and it's just an observation, just from listening and learning that we have a lot of work to do 
um, around having those meaningful conversations with children and young people. It doesn't have to be a detailed conversation. It's about giving somebody, you know, an example being if somebody's late for school every day, have we ever considered that there might be parental drug and alcohol use in that household? rather than the fact that they're just being awkward and difficult and being late for school. So it's those subtle observations. And it's a bit like what I said in the chat box. Children are desperate for people. They're desperate because they're fearful of saying anything, but they're desperate for adults to notice. And I think we'll have a responsibility to think about how collectively we do that. And that needs to come from uh, a strategy that helps us to move forward as organisations. That's all I wanted to say, really. I think on the back of that it's always important that like young like it's harder in primary school and maybe even early mm -hmm. secondary school to sort of confront the fact that a young person is living with drug and alcohol but like the young people are living in that situation and they are in that household and if you start mm -hmm. stigmatizing it and if you start beating around the bush and going oh what do you know instead of just being like if the young person uh -huh. says that mummy took a white powder is consider is it appropriate to tell them that's cocaine or something like and it might yeah. be regardless of their age and if you're going to stigmatize it we're going to stigmatize it mm -hmm. so part of like destigmatizing it for us is professionals destigmatizing it as well and actually feeling confident no matter what the age is to, to actually have those tough conversations with them and I think you did right, Aidan and just to kind of before before I, I just go because I do think it, you know your voice really and I have to say to you Aidan I appreciate both you and th th there's a person sharing the stories because those are the stories that we need to build our you know the foundations that we need to build our services on and I think you know for me when we look at children and young people presenting in a certain way we need to have that professional curiosity and, and understand it in context so thank you anyway Aidan thank you I'll, I'll I'll go now because I'm mindful that we might um, take up too much time. So Claire, the final question, um, it was in the chat, um, Rob's flagged that, but it, she also had a hand raised um, a couple of minutes ago. So I think it was Katisha, um, if she would like to come on and ask a question that she also posted in the chat. Yeah, I, th I, th I feel like it's pretty much been said, to be honest, because um, it's just been really... Um, cathartic in a, in a way to listen to a, to a lot of like-minded people and you know speaking with so much passion but you know just thinking about the work that I've done with some young people I think Melanie you've just said it you know and and Aidan as well in terms of having those difficult conversations and actually if it's relevant to that young person and they need to sound it out with somebody and talk about it then the last thing that they need is a kind of like a, a, a shine away reaction then they need that support and it's there I think Kira you said it is there it's happening so we, we do need to have these conversations and yeah again I do get that reaction from professionals in terms of even when you're willing to speak about it how do I do it how do I initiate that how much do I say and actually we become really really um competent I'd say we're talking about like sex and relationships but not so much with, with substance misuse. Um, so I think all the suggestions today have been really useful. I found it incredibly useful and I appreciate everybody who's um, said their bit. So thank you very much. Thank you. So that brings us to um, the end for today. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for attending. Thank you to all our speakers. Um, and a massive thank you to Aidan and Kira for sharing your experiences and being so vocal and, and leaving us with all so much to think about, really. Um, so the whole morning, I think, has probably given everybody a lot of food for thought. I know it certainly has um, for myself and our organisation and how we progress with our hidden harm strategy. So lots to think about. Um, but just a couple of things before we finish. Um, so for those of you based in the northeast, you can sign up as a Fuse associate and to Fuse Early Life and Adolescence Research Program, if you've not already. Um, this will ensure we can let you know about any relevant opportunities to engage with Fuse. The link uh, should be in the chat box and will be shared after the event. Um, all slides and recordings will be shared. I know that was asked a few times in the chat, so just to reassure everybody that all slides and recordings will be shared. Um, and 
just a reminder for everybody who might not be aware that ADFARM do hold monthly practitioner forums. Um, for people that are interested in this area of work, the next one is the 25th of November. I'll be presenting um, at that next one about the um, work being done by Change Grow Live Services across the country to support children and young people um, and our development as a treatment agency of a hidden harm strategy. Um, so Cassie, Rob, Laura, unless I've missed anything, is that us for the morning? Yes, it is. Thanks. Can I just say that there has been a couple of questions in the chat around sharing of presentations, resources and the recording of the meeting. So as soon as we've got all that on the FUSE website, we'll send you a link so you can easily access that. And if there's anybody else who's got any other materials uh, that they would like to share, they send them to, to me and I'll share them with the event um, programme leads. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. And thank you, everybody, for this morning. That's it. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.